Hey CSU, welcome to another interview. Even though semester's over, we're gonna keep coming with the content because hey, now you're on break, you must be having time to watch the video. So get excited for our guest today, who's John Flett, who's joining us from down in Melbourne. Uh, John's the author of The Witness of God, The Trinity, Missio Dei, Karl Barth, and The Nature of Christian Community, and Apostolicity, The Ecumenical Question in World Christian Perspective. And John is also the coordinator of studies in missiology at Pilgrim Theological College, where he has the great pleasure of teaching me. So, John, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Yeah, well, we're very excited to be able to get mostly into this book today, Apostolicity, which people can check out on Amazon or Book Depository or wherever they might find it. Now, that's like a word that possibly some of us aren't familiar with. Like from context, you might go, okay, apostle, I, I know what that means, or at least that's what it's about. But could you help us understand what apostolicity is and why you thought this was a good lens uh, through which to approach the ecumenical question in world Christianity? So it's, yes, not many people might know about it, but uh, the fact is apostolicity was sort of the question at the heart of the Reformation. So apostolicity was uh, one of the main reasons why schism between the Catholic and the Protestant churches occurred. So one of the critiques was the reformers saw what they described as corruption within uh, the Catholic church and corruption soon, the complaint of corruption soon became a discussion concerning authority. And then it became a concern with bishops. If bishops were the ones that were saying, this is how we should operate, then bishops are a bit of an issue. And uh, so you had some lines of the debate that were perhaps saying, you need to listen to us, we're the ones in authority. And the reformers then sort of said, well, where do we go if uh, that authority isn't necessarily the best one? So they went to the Bible. So sola scriptura, uh, scripture alone, is actually a way of talking about apostolicity. So apostolicity has got to do with how do you actually connect with the basis of the faith? How do we know that we are in some sort of faithful continuity through history in line with what Jesus said and taught? Uh, so it's right there, basic to the Reformation. And it's caused a number of problems through the years. Should we or should we not have bishops? It becomes a very basic way of talking about things. But there is a third way of talking about apostolicity, and that's mission. So the apostles are the sent ones. It's a way of uh, thinking about mission. So through history, we've had these three ways of understanding apostolicity. Bishops, Bible, and mission. So this is sort of important for two reasons uh, with regards to world Christianity. The first has got to do with organic unity. So organic unity within the ecumenical movement is a way of talking about structural unity that we are all together. So there's one church. So the uniting church is a type of expression at looking at organic unity. How can we have a single structure? In other words, how can we actually share communion with one another in the Eucharist? We run into questions here because for some traditions, the bishops are the ways in which you talk about the efficacy of the Eucharist. If there's no bishop, it becomes very difficult to say the Eucharist is doing its job. Uh, shared ministry. So if I'm ordained in one denomination, it's sometimes very difficult to be transferred to another ordination. Sometimes you have to do more study. Sometimes it just doesn't occur. Uh, so apostolicity is then linked to the question of schism and unity, what is the nature of Christian unity? The problem is, because it's come out of the Reformation, it's a very determined question. So it's directed in a certain way, and it means that the structural diversity we see within the world Christianity becomes read through the lens of the schism of the Reformation. So if the Reformation didn't occur and we had the Catholic and Orthodox churches and the Catholic church remained as it was and went through Europe and went to America, then all of the diversity you see in Africa, Asia and Latin America, according to this theory, would remain within the Catholic church. So all of the different ways in which uh, the Christian church is becoming embodied around the world is all read back 
into the schism. Yeah. So there's a clear link between diversity and division. So when you read ecumenical documentation uh, concerning diversity, it's always put on put limits on it. So if you don't limit diversity, it leads to division. The question is, is that a correct assumption? The second assumption being made is, of course, that there uh, that continuity and diversity is linked to a movement of an institution, and this institution has gone from Jerusalem to Rome to the northern tribes, northern Europe to the UK, to America, and then only at the end of that, it's become a world religion, which is, of course, historical nonsense. But it has a very, it has a very strong theological driver to it. So one of the reasons why it's important is because it's actually set that uh, framework for understanding how we understand or perceive, relate to the manifold richness that is now world Christianity. The second reason it's important is because if we do understand apostolicity through the language of structured Bible and mission, then these are the key focuses within world Christianity. World Christianity in Africa, Asia, and Latin America is struggling to understand what does the appropriation of the gospel look like within our local context against our local heritage? How does it take on form and how does it form communities? What is conversion? What's the relationship to the religious past? Uh, all of these types of questions are the questions that are driving it. So it's got nothing, to, it's, not a, it's not an issue of should we or should we not have structure? It's an issue of how do we actually speak the gospel through the structures that we do have? What is conversion, conversion of these structures? So this type of discussion within world Christianity is, is really not, in my opinion, well understood or well incorporated within the more formal ecumenical discussions concerning organic unity. But I think that a better understanding of Christian diversity and how it actually functions in forming communities and forming structures uh, will lead us to better answers for Christian unity more generally. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, John. That's a really good uh, initial like introduction to what the problem is. And I think the book does that really well in the early chapters of showing just how certain assumptions uh, just carry through so predominantly in the way we conceive world Christianity. So uh, thanks for breaking that down a little bit for us. Um, one of the important arguments in your book, or at least that I found important, was your identification that different structural expressions of the church emerging out of cross-cultural transmission are met with often suspicion or, as you say, fear of creating division, uh, rather than being embraced as, and a quote here, a positive consequence of the lived appropriation of and witness to the gospel by identifiable Christian communities in different historical and cultural settings. Um, could you expand a little on this argument for us and how you feel that a pluriformity of expression is actually more consistent with the New Testament witness than we might first uh, suspect? So there's a fair bit of jargon in that, pluriformity of expression being one of the things. I'm good at jargon. Uh, <laughs> the uh, question might be broken down in terms of uh, an interpretation of diversity. Yeah. How do we interpret diversity? And what are the criteria and authority by which this diversity might be evaluated? Mm -hmm. So the language, there's no agent in the question per se. It's just, this is being met by. So who's meeting this? Who's meeting this with fear and suspicion? Right? Yeah. And yeah, it, tends be, it tends to be uh, Western authors. Yeah. So Western authors are meeting this with fear and suspicion. Uh, we talk about fear and suspicion when we were being threatened. So what's under threat? Where, where does the fear response come from? Uh, to put, and to put the question in a very odd way, what is being threatened when we're confronted by the growth of Christian communities who seek to be faithful to the gospel? Hmm. So we are being threatened by Christian communities that are growing, that all they desire to be is faithful to the gospel. So why is that a threat? Mm -hmm. That's a great it's an odd. It's an odd question, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but it's a real question. This experience is, is a real threat. So uh, my answer, which, you know, I try and lay, lay out in the first half of the book, is looking at how is the ecumenical movement and theologians trying to answer the problem of apostolicity? 
So uh, the ecumenical movement has learned that you can't talk about bishops. If you talk about bishops, you're immediately in the division that says we have bishops or we don't have bishops. So it's a non-starter in terms of the unity question. So what they've done is they've sort of trained, they've in, introduced different language. So um, the Lima document or Baptist Eucharist and Ministry, it's a fairly famous document from 1982, uh, used the language of apostolic tradition. So we've got apostolic succession, which is bishops laying on of hands through history. But apostolic tradition was a way of opening up the idea that there are many different ways or many different languages of practices within the New Testament that might be counted as part of the apostolic tradition. Mm. So the way into the issue, funnily enough, has come through the language of mission and witness. We can all agree that we are, as a body of Christ, to witness to the kingdom of God. We might disagree on what the shape that witness takes, but we all agree that this is what we're supposed to do. Mm. And mission becomes or receives a particular definition. And that definition is that it's the gestalt of a community. In other words, there is a community that's being built up through its own rhythms, through its practices. It matures in the faith. It's cultivated. It grows. And each person within that community has received gifts. Each one of these gifts is to be cultivated. And as the community goes about its daily life with one another, that leads to light, witness, and that's mission. So the world should be able to look at us and see what, what is it like to embody the kingdom of God insofar as we're able. Now, every community needs leadership. This leadership, according to this argument, needs to grow out of the gospel and express the gospel. So what ends up happening is we get to the language of leadership through the language of mission. Leaders, leadership's a gift through the New Testament. Uh, and they go to the ecumenical discussion, go to forms of leadership that have been identified in early Christian history. So they talk about the threefold ministry of bishop, presbyter and deacon. So we get back to bishops by talking about the mission of the community. Mm. Now, one way, one it sounds very formal, but one, one, major, one major benefit of this is to understand the church, the community, as a culture. Mm. So maturity in the faith includes maturation into this culture or enculturation. So we, we become enculturated into its rhythms, its practices, and we are built up in a type of ethos. The difficulty with that, for me, is what happens when the church moves across culture. So if we're saying that the, con and the argument for continuity, it's quite a good argument because we can say that the, a culture is con continuous through time while also changing. So it gives us the ability to change through time, but also to stay the same. We are identified as this people. So even if it looks different from 2000 years ago, it's still the same community. So we have continuity and change through time precisely as a culture. However, if we go across cultural borders, all of a sudden we look very different because we're built up with certain rhythms. So we looked at, we looked very foreign in different places. Now the form of mission that that takes, in my opinion, is colonization mm. because essentially we're saying we're planting a different culture somewhere else and you have to be enculturated into this culture. And then you'll find arguments that basically say, well, okay, the culture that we're talking about has gone through Western civilization, but that's also part of God's good graces. So if you now have to take on forms that look very, very English or very German, that's actually part of the good grace of the gospel of God converting cultures. I find the argument a bit problematic, but it's the one that's driving, well, it's driving a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And you can read an awful lot of material now that basically says we've lost tradition the way in which we witness to the gospel is enculturating people into it through Eucharist, through baptism, 
and this then creates an identity, the Christian identity, this identity is the thing that's over against globalization or whatever it is. Uh, I remain unconvinced. In fact, I think it's I think it's problematic. And on a completely different, well, not on a different tangent, I think the danger of it is seen precisely in the American elections, yeah. where you're getting a group of people who are fearful, who are identifying as Christian, and that fear is actually driving the type of response. So we're, we're arguing for a cultural form, and if that cultural form comes under threat through diversity, then we respond with uh, the type of fear language, mm. hate language that ends up coming out. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, what The second part of the question is, why do I think the uh, pluriformity of expression is more consistent with the New Testament? So, theorists of world Christianity tend to be historians. <laughs> and those historians have looked at how has the church actually, in history, remained through history mm. and someone like Andrew Walls will argue the church has only remained continuous as it has gone across cultural borders. So it hasn't remained continuous as a culture. It's only remained as it's gone across cultural borders and taken on different questions, mm. taken on different shape, taken on different form. So they will say that actually the only way that you can actually talk about the church being continuous through culture is as it goes across the border from Rome to the Northern tribes and the way the Norman tribes, Northern tribes interpret it or the way it goes from uh, North Africa to the Southern parts of Africa. So they then turn around and say, actually you'll just see this in the new Testament. So this pattern that you see through history is actually the pattern that you see in the New Testament when it goes from Jerusalem to Antioch, yeah. when it goes to these places where people now become called Christian. And one of the examples is Paul's, uh, the question that he's asked about whether you can eat meat offered to idols. Mm. See, it's a very funny question because uh, no Jew is going to ask that question mm. because it's banned by law. Yep. So there's n none of them are actually going to turn around and, and have that problem. They're not going to meet with Gentiles. They're not going to fellowship. There's a, there's, a, there's a thing that's prescribed that that's just an impossibility. Because the gospel's now gone across these borders, these questions start to arise. And these questions become the basis of theological reflection. How do we actually deal with that? How do we think about that? And Paul's answer is very interesting because he says, well, I don't have a clue. And then he says, the only thing that I really know is that you need to be guided by the law of love. Mm. So this is a different way of asking theological questions and a different way of, of dealing with things. So you get this famous quote from Martin Kaler a hundred odd years ago that says, mission is the mother of theology because it confronts the local culture. So going across borders raises all these questions that you need theological reflection upon. So it's not necessarily a simple mining of the tradition so that we repeat it. It's actually this sort of rather uh, fecund creative process. So it's more, it's more consistent with the new Testament because that's what you see. Yeah, that's great. And uh, people will see there um, a good example of why John's a good teacher to have because he took my rambly paragraph of a question which didn't really uh, specify it on anything, turned it around, and we got an awesome response. So uh, thanks for that, John, for bringing that out. Um, now, were you mentioning mission there in the end, as mission is the mother of theology and the importance of mission. And this emerges strongly uh, through your work, and you draw on uh, an emphasis of mission as communication or cultivation, like, you know, in different ways that is perceived. Uh, now, I mentioned as well, you've also written The Witness of God, uh, which posits that the neglect of mission as a theological locus has harmful consequences for understanding both the nature of God's connection with the world and the corresponding nature of the Christian community. Now, in, in previous uh, interviews, uh, the one with David Congdon in particular, I've gone on and on about my like, past and even maybe present cringiness and, uh, and skepticism to the kind of idea of mission because in my mind, I've got all this baggage of, wait, isn't that when the church went wrong? Isn't that what led to colonization? Isn't that what currently leads to like 
people getting Facebook profile pics with um, young African children. You know, isn't that what leads to people doing turn and burn? You've got to like that kind of thinking. Um, however, what we're seeing from, I guess, from your book and from your response is that mission is actually what keeps the church from imposing the center on the margins and, and from reducing the proclamation of the gospel to the enforcing of a culture. Um, could you expand on a little for that? I'm sorry, could you expand a little of, on that for us? And you, feel free just to tell me exactly why I'm wrong uh, all the way down. That's a perfectly reasonable way to go about it. So, uh, yeah, mission's a uh, problematic term. Mission has this baggage, and it's a legitimate baggage for mission to have because yeah. certain things have occurred. Uh, so it's a question of how do you define this term? Now, if you define this term, which is the popular way of defining this term, that you have a Christian West mm -hmm. who calls or certain individuals get called, get financed, they get put somewhere else to proclaim a type of gospel. That is a particular definition of mission. Mm -hmm. And it's been a fairly, you know, robust definition for a period of time. But we need to start uh, looking in different ways. One is the colonial period is a very particular period. And it's driven by a particular set of understandings about efficiency, about culture, about truth, about how truth's appropriated, about form, about structure. So the study of the colonial period for mission, I think, is one of the best things that you can do because it actually tells you a lot about yourself and your own faith. Now, the question is a very large one and can be parsed in a number of different ways. In 1952, there was a statement that came out from the ecumenical movement called the Role, R-O-L-L-E, statement. And this was basically looking at the development of ecumenism around the world. And it, it's, it makes an interesting point. And it is the problem of colonization is not a missionary problem. It's a problem of the sending churches. So what are the missionaries in the sense of this, trying to plant. Well, they're just trying to plant a church. Mm. And what does the church look like? Well, the church looks exactly the same as the church from where they came from. Yeah. So what are they trying to do? Well, all they're trying to do is baptize, create liturgy, have worship with certain values, and certain understandings of what it means to be a mature Christian. So it means that all the missionaries are doing is picking up what they understand the church to be and plonking it down. So the problem isn't with the missionary per se. The problem is in the way in which truth is being identified or the essence of Christianity identified as being uh, understood, mandated back home right, at the sending country. Now, you don't see that problem if you never go outside yourself. The only way that you get revealed as being a colonialist is if you go to some other place. So it's all very comfortable to stay at home and to say we're tolerant and we're wonderful and we're, we don't have any culture and we don't have any values and we, you know, we're just simply pure exponents of the gospel. The problem is that is demonstrated to be bullshit. <laughs> when you actually move across those cultural borders and all of a sudden people start saying, well, really, is that how you want to read the text? Or isn't that a little, a little too white male Western? And it becomes very difficult for us to take on that critique because we really think this is the essence of the gospel. So uh, in witness of God and other places, I talk about non missionary mission. So every community whether they say they are into mission or not, engage in mission. Every community wants to explain itself. Every community wants to say, this is where the truth and the value lies. Every one of them does. The problem is, if you're non-missionary, we'll get to what that means. If, you, if, you're, if you're really internally focused, 
the missionary activity that you have will be the replication of yourself. So we get a number of little selves dotted all around the world. And the, the benefit of that for us is that they confirm us in our own truth. So if we get someone from a very different context saying, yeah, I think I agree with you on all of these types of issues, then it's actually saying something about how wonderful I am and the truth that's contained within me. Now, the issue with culture and with, uh, you know, you might see Kavanaugh, Lindbeck, Kalvas, uh, Milbank, all of these types of arguments for the building up of a Christian culture and a Christian identity is a doubling down for me on the problem of colonization. Because what we've do now is we've reified this particular culture, this conceived culture, we, we call it tradition. Okay. This conceived tradition is made into a thing of itself. And that's the thing that has to be taken all around the world. But the tradition itself never talks about mission. So you'll never see any of these guys write about mission or mission theory. So there's no sort of external critique coming in about this tradition. So one of the things the role statement really highlighted for me, but a number of different ways is that the more you don't talk about mission, the more you stand guilty of colonization. Yeah. Because you've got no external critique coming in that says, really, you need to start thinking about how you have domesticated the gospel. Mission, on the other hand, uh, if we link it to the doctrine or the nature of God, God going outside God's self actually is defining of who God is. So the notion that uh, in order to find our Christian identity, who we are as Christian people, is not something that we possess. It's only something that, as in the impulsion of the spirit, we go outside of ourselves and talk about the gospel. So only as we're doing that do we start to understand the nature of Christian identity. And the more people that we start having discussions with and the more sort of crit criticisms we receive back uh, shapes how we understand our community. So an example, I mean, easy, there are just so many examples now. Interreligious dialogue, mm -hmm. clear example. Migrants, refugees, clear example. Gay, lesbian questions, clear example. If you don't have this, again, you run into the type of problems that we're seeing in the States. But the States are a simple way of saying this is actually happening here. We're doing the same thing. We just can't necessarily see it. Mm. One way that you can see it, I think, is uh, through Christmas. Because okay. in Christmas, we have a Jesus that doesn't speak. In, in uh, non-Western context, Christmas as a big religious holiday is actually marked by hospitality. Hmm. So it's inviting other friends of other religions over to your house and celebrating things. So it's a big movement of hospitality. Within uh, West, it tends to be a children's uh, service, which is banal. <laughs> and then we go home and have family celebrations mm. under a pine tree in Australia. <laughs> so we have all these cultural rhythms that are built up as a central holiday that talks about God becoming incarnate mm. in the most vulnerable, t vulnerable position. So the family is poor. Family is forced out of home. Family is having to live with animals. Family is, I don't know if you've ever seen like a stable, like a real small one where everyone's jammed in. It ain't pretty. There's yeah. shit everywhere. Sure. This is where the family's born. Immediately upon being born, the family's driven out. They become migrants. They have to go to uh, Egypt under the pain of persecution. So we are talking about refugees. We're talking about migrants. We're talking about all of this type of thing at the Christmas period. And yet we never talk about that. Mm -hmm. So Christmas is not a time for talking about that in our churches. So what we've done is we've built up a certain layer of contextualization. 
you go to Africa in the middle of the year, you'll find little pine trees on altars, like little Christmas pine trees, little plastic ones, because that's how they perceive the gospel to be. Now that's us taking certain cultural rhythms that just don't belong, saying this is a cent- not necessarily articulating it, but you know presenting it as being essential to the gospel. Now that's non-missionary because it has no real way of thinking its way through what actually is the nature of the gospel. How do we interpret things? What is our hermeneutic of it all? Uh, so my definition of mission is actually going to the margins or actually receiving the margins, listening to what's going on. And that, and only in that way, as you receive this type of this constant to and fro of discussion, are you actually going to get to some sort of understanding of what's going on? Mm. And that'll include really bizarre, well, for me, bizarre things, you know, looking at exorcisms, looking at healing, trying to understand what's going on within the communities there and what they're trying to tell us is going on. Uh, I think there's a lot more, and a lot better way of understanding evil, mm. spirituality. It's very different from an understanding of mission that basically says, we've got it all here, we're going to take it there, and we're going to plant it. So the, the, you know, the picture of the European looking after little African children, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a problem for me too. Mm. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. That was really fascinating. Like, so much to challenge, so much to discuss in our groups from that response alone. So thank you for that, John. Um, We're kind of getting toward the end of the time. Um, And I was going to, you've mentioned migration a bit in that. And I was uh, going to ask you about, you know, you seem to have a focus, especially in your teaching on uh, migrant and migrant churches and refugees. And I know I was looking, I think next year you're teaching uh, multicultural and migrant churches in political, theological, and spiritual perspectives. Um, So maybe just Briefly, you could uh, give, if you wanted, you could give a bit of a, either a plug for that course or just what kind of excites you about teaching uh, about the way, you know, the gospel and migrants uh, collide. Uh, one of the things that have really confronted me since I've come to Australia mm-hmm. is the way in which everyone talks about the church is dying. So death becomes the way of talking about the church. It's the first lens through which we conceive things, Mm -hmm. which of course is theologically completely improper. The the first lens through which we should talk is resurrection. So joy, hope. Mm -hmm. So why is the very first place we go to the language of a dying church? Uh, It's a very odd place to start. So there's a there's, so we're talking about anxiety. We're talking about fear. We're talking about I don't know a vision of what the church should be and how somehow we're not living up to that vision. Uh, of course, we're talking about finances. We're talking about constriction. It's a bit of a problem yeah. because no one wants to join anything that has no joy. Yeah. Then you look at migrant churches. In migrant churches, I've got a really good quote, actually. Uh, I've got a quote from, uh, as uh, you've got refugees that are coming close to the border of America, so South Americans coming to the border of America, what a number of Christian groups have done is actually sent Americans over the border with massive amounts of water and food. And they simply sit in places where they know that people are going to be coming because basically by the stage that they've got there, they've got nothing. They've got no water, no food, dehydrated. And there's a story about one person who's sitting basically in the bush, sees a group of people coming towards them and says, do you have any water? Mm. And this group get together and they huddle and then they discuss and then they come back to the person and they say, we don't have much water, but we can give you what we have. Yeah. So they interpreted the question as, could mm. you give me water? Yeah, incredible. <laughs> now, that's people giving out of what they don't have. Mm. Now, it's that type of spirituality, that type of rhythm, that type of you've gone through a major hardship journey, and the question that you don't get, so they've got nothing. Yeah. They're threatened with life, they're moving for a reason, They've got no water, they've got no food, and their first response is giving. Mm. 
their first response is not, we are dying. Mm -hmm. So we are dying out of our much, yeah. and they are giving out of their need. Yeah. And it's those types of lessons which just keep reverberating every time you go to these types of communities. And there's joy. I mean, they have nothing. And there's joy, and there's hope. They're concerned about visas. Can they stay? They've got issues of racism, you know, communities in which they don't necessarily fit. And yet all they're doing is they're giving out of, out of need. They're wanting to build community. They're wanting to build relationship. They have strong belief in something that they're actually trying to communicate with people. They're supporting one another. So you start seeing prayer. Instead of prayer being sort of an individual piety, self, uh, I'm going to have a little quiet time, it's actually building one another up supporting one another, uh, identifying need and responding to it. So it's that. What is that? It's not doctrine, although it should have a good doctrinal base. It's not spirituality in the sense that if we have a nicely laid out space that has appropriate numbers of candles and things like that, it's actually a response to human community in need. And I think if you can give, if students can catch that sort of image of what it is, I think you're liberated. I think it's a freeing type of vision. Uh, so I've been, I mean, I go to a number of church services. Sometimes you sit through an hour long church service and you just wish God would take you now. Uh, other times you're there for six hours and you haven't even noticed it pass. Mm. And it's that sort of connection that I think a number of uh, Westerners are trying to look for. Mm. And yet on the other hand, we'd like to control everything so tightly that we can't actually, you know, even if that was jumping us and whacking us on the head, we wouldn't notice it. Yeah. So one of the issues what I tried to sort of talk about, and we actually visit Christian, we actually visit these communities and then go and have chats and try and work out what's going on and why it's going on. Uh, advocacy and action. The course itself takes three, three different sections, really. It takes the section of political theory. Mm -hmm. So how, how, how is politics actually shaped where we are now? The second one looks more precisely at, uh, the ch at migrant churches, but challenges. One way of thinking about migrant churches is talking about cultural induction. So when we want to protect our culture. We've come from somewhere. We want to protect that culture and our identity against assimilation. So there are challenges along that. Uh, there are long challenges with things like 1.5 generation who don't really feel like they belong in either place. How do you actually... Talk about it. So I don't think migrant churches are the salvation of the Western church, which you'll get from a lot of, a lot of discussions. But the final part is actually looking at theologies that develop it. And one of the theologies that uh, are very particular, very significant here, is the theology of hospitality. Mm. And what's the relationship between guest and host? Mm. So, a lot of the theologies will actually talk about how Jesus is coincidentally yeah. guest and host. So you get these funny parables where he's invited to someone's house, but he's clearly also hosting them. Yeah. So he's a guest, but also a host. Uh, Eucharist's the same thing, guest and host. So one of the advocacy things I think we need to think about is how we are host all the time. And when we're host all the time, we are always in positions of power. Yep. And when we're always in positions of power, we're not empowering other people. Mm. So we're encouraging dependency. We're encouraging all of those types of very, very negative sort of things. We're not actually allowing people to engage with their, with their now local environment. So one of the things about the study of this, hopefully, is learning how we are also guests in relation to refugees. Mm. That's, yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I, I really, people should check that out. Um, Pilgrim is great online. So even if you're not in Melbourne, uh, have a look into it. Um, 
John, thank you so much for being here. And uh, is there anything we can, other than people going and buying Apostolicity, buying Witness of God and rating and reviewing on Amazon and all those good things, uh, anything else you'd like to uh, plug or shout out? Oh, dude, enroll in the courses for sure. Yeah. yeah good fun. Yeah, great. Yeah, people should check them out. Um, well, John, thank you once again so much for being here. And uh, yeah, we look forward to discussing all of this uh, going forward. Wonderful. Thank you very much.